Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea yeah. <laughs> Welcome everyone to a new episode of the One Brain Cell Podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea and today's episode we are coming at you with a review of the two most recent releases we've decided to cover which are uh, Shape and Destroy by Rustin Kelly and King's Disease by acclaimed rapper Nas. And in our third episode today, we are going to be discussing Morgan's recommended album of the week, which is Thrice's v- Visu. Visu. Olsen. Yeah, we're also discussing. That was Angel, that Angel was Olsen's a song. that was just awful. What? Why did you did you try to cough? Oh like I don't. Oh. <laughs> We're also <laughs> like going to be discussing oh, Angel Olsen's oh, new oh, album, Whole New Mess. Whole new if mess. You all shut but not up, fuck up for a second, so I can say that. <laughs> yep. It's Thank you, Tyler. If you care for about Angel Olsen of the Olsen twins. So I, I'm very sorry oh, that the Olsen twins. Home <laughs> could not hear anything that was happening, um, but catch Good. up. Yeah. Cool. So, new Rustin Great. Kelly, new Nas, yes. new Angel Olsen, and in a record club review, we're going to be discussing Thrice's Visu. Go and check it out after you've watched this. But first, let's go. Well, actually, wait, one important thing. Uh, please, if you haven't already, although judging by the view count, you most certainly have, go check out Tyler's new video mm-hmm. on Autecker with his worst to best. It's this a boy. great fucking video. Uh, also, and, the objectively yeah. correct ranking as well. The and I will not hear otherwise. Ranking. Yes. Because uh, mm. we believe in objectivity here, a, a thing yes. we all definitely endorse. We I also mean, have a lot of that's other. That's why every record we get the same score to. Yeah. Yep, a five for everything. So we've spoiled it. That's the end of the Jams and Tea podcast. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, in this episode, that's <laughs> not inaccurate for at least one of Ooh. these. Ooh. All right. All the records are mediocre. Let's, let's jump into yeah. our regular uh, opening segment for what yeah. we've been right, listening yeah. to. Um, <laughs> yeah, so again, try to keep it uh, brief. Five albums that you, each of us have been listening to in the last week uh, that we think are worthy of mention. Shout out. Um, Jake, why don't you lead us off? Okay, well, piggybacking off of Tyler's video, I elected to check out another Autecker album just because it was the one that you recommended to me based on my taste, and you did a great job of selling it in the video, which is Oversteps, which, as predicted, as I am quite the predictable lad, that is my current favorite Autecker record, followed very, very closely by Confield. It's, it's like they're both just neck and neck, frankly, but Oversteps is a spectacular record. Um, I I love it to pieces. It's very ambient, very, I mean, like, I hate to, like, say this, like, it's the uh, only basis for comparison I have, but there were many moments where I was reminded of the Tunes compilation of Burial, just very specific, very similar sonic palettes on some songs, but overall, it's a bit more dreamy, but also has that, like, immediacy I really like about Autechre's music, the, the textured driving beats combined with the very twinkly, dreamy aesthetics. I've listened to that like three times this week just because it's so relaxing and enchanting. Mm-hmm. Um, One thing I want to see is a remix of Autechre's Oversteps and John Coltrane's Giant Steps. <laughs> <laughs> what was the second record you wanted to shout out? Second record I wanted to talk about. Uh, I'll I'll do the two records I listened to uh, last night and this morning uh, because I did them as a a, a double listen both times. Uh, and that is first up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are floating in space by Spiritualized, which. Uh, Tyler has been tossing out Spiritualized as a recommendation for the longest time now. I'm pretty sure August has listened to Laser Guided Melodies at some point, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to check out that record. Um, most notably, like, when I, like, I just first started listening to it, uh, Tyler was just like, I think that's, I think you said it was you, what you've considered to be the best record of 1997. Yes? 
Yep, uh, I, I said that like because that is specifically a significant is, year for music for me. Well, um, and OK Computer is pretty much the dominator of most lists, which you, you said that specifically because like I was just like, oh, wow, that's a really bold claim to make because I know it's not his favorite, but I know it's he still likes that record. And I listened to it and I might agree. It's it's really fucking good, you guys. It's It's like, it is the perfect breakup album it is it is so like spacey and and beautiful and brilliant but also so chaotic and noisy and it's it's so compelling and it's so good and the final track is 16 minutes long and it rocks my fucking shit it's so great and it also has this thing where it's like every other song is like a really kind of chaotic more noisy thing and then like the other song like interchangeably will be like something a little bit more like melody driven and, and spacious and it's just oh it's it's so good and when like the harmonies of like the choir that they have coming in singing like gang vocals on some of the choruses oh my god it's so fucking good um and on the complete opposite spectrum of that, the other record I listened to was The Terror by The Flaming Lips. Um, so far, my favorite Flaming Lips record, because I also listened to Soft Bulletin earlier this week, but uh, I did enjoy that record. But The Terror, uh, this record, uh, it, makes you your, it makes it your bitch. It's, 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 it's so oppressive and bleak and overpowering and it is kind of unpleasant in some instances like there's one song on there that just genuinely makes my skin crawl and it just like gets inside me and I just I don't I don't care for that feeling but overall it's it is so fascinating and and strange and I I love it it's it's really damn good um so that's three uh I discovered also uh, another fantastic record that I found this week was uh, Elliot Smith's XO, uh, which is probably my favorite uh, Elliot Smith record, which I didn't anticipate because his song titled is fucking perfect. And I was like, this is probably as good as it gets. And then I listened to XO and was like, ah, fuck. Cause uh, yeah, that record's really fucking awesome too. If you want sad acoustic boy shit, uh, but it, EXO has a little bit more studio stuff. It's got like a fuller sounding production, even though for Elliot Smith, that's not like saying a lot. It's pretty minimal in comparison to most albums. But if you listen to like either or first and then go to that, it's like there's a world of difference. Um, so I highly recommend that. Um, I also listened to... I listened to Us by Peter Gabriel uh, because I'm getting into Peter Gabriel's albums and that record is astonishingly good. I, I might prefer Melt by a Hair just because I feel like it's a bit more focused, like all the songs are a bit more concise. Some of the songs on Us just, they, they, they overstay their welcome only slightly, but oh my God, it's, it's, there's not a song I would cut there. It's, it's a great record. Um, fantastic. I can't wait to spend more time with it. So I listen to a lot of shit. It's great. I also got a Cocteau Twins vinyl and it's pretty and I like it. This is cute, but you're cute. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Quit it with that gay shit. <laughs> Moving swiftly along. This podcast um, brand is August, what, what have you been listening to uh, in the last uh, seven days? Okay, well, I've been out. listening to things that'll make people pretty happy uh listen to uh the cocteau twins and harold buds the moon and the melodies which i enjoyed a lot it's Yay. a quite quite nice kind of dream pop ambient record i uh, it's very chill i mean uh this is good it's good uh listened to the chemical brothers dig your own hole oh shit you didn't mm. mention that you did oh did you I don't know if you mentioned it. I, I did not. Because, mentioned it now. Well, that's like I a childhood, it. that's a seminal childhood record of mine, so. Oh, yeah. It, well, of course, it's of course awesome. it is. Um, <laughs> it, it's an awesome album. No, it's like, not a mean, di- that's not a dig at all. I'm just like, what the fuck else was Tyler listening to when he was <laughs> like five? <laughs> no, seriously, my dad was really into them. Like He, he played Dig Your Own Hole uh, and Surrender. <laughs> Tyler came out the womb listening to Yola Tango and spiritualized. 
<laughs> no, like Both? I grew up in a household where you were listening to dance music, club shit. Um, no, I mean that's baller as hell. Yeah. No, I mean uh, it's it's very good. It's very, it's just very fun. I mean, uh, kind of something you can have in the background or in the foreground of your mind, and you'll get about the same experience. It's like uh, max, maximalist, um, break big beat dance music, but with a psychedelic tinge as well. Yeah, which I I especially liked about it the kind of psychedelic aspects. Uh, I listened to uh, Lyra, Lyra Pramuk's Fountain, which is a you did that great. Intre- well done. an interesting piece of like ambient acapella stuff. Uh, very, very weird. I would recommend you check it out if you like weird ambient stuff. You know who you are. Uh, kind of random. He's just making stuff up now. <laughs> well, now I'm not going to make stuff up. I'm going to talk in uh, m- like more Morgan language with uh, okay. Miles Davis's mm. "In a Silent right. Way." Uh, it's yes, sir. It, it's in a silent way. I mean, it's awesome. It's got just <laughs> some of the most interesting pieces of music ever. Mm-hmm. The title piece is so is like one of the prettiest things I've ever heard. Uh, every part of it's great. I wouldn't change your note of it. It's uh, it's exceptional. Yes, I, I believe when when the tremolos sang "Silence is Golden," they were referring to Miles Davis's wow. 1969 album. I'd say I do enjoy the amount of times our review of records are just well, it's the record. Like when uh, I mean, I'm trying to go through these like, quickly. Well, like, do you want me to dis- give you a dissertation? No, no, no. On- but no. Point is, is that yes, that's you need yes, to say. I uh, want a dissertation from August wow. on it. I want five there. five pages on my desk by tomorrow morning. My point on, is, is that sometimes a silent way. that's all you need to say about a record, and I think that's cool. No, fair enough, fair enough. It's the uh, silent, and silent up, way. And to wrap up my five, I listened to uh, the Mahavishnu Orchestra with John McLaughlin's. Uh, the Inner Mounting Flame, which... Good Yeah. More like which The Inner is... Mounting Flames. Yeah. It's a good album. It's, uh, it's <laughs> awesome. I'm gonna, I've I'm heard gonna, it. I'm going to mount started... your Inner Flame. Please. Mm. That's that's mean. Enough with this gay shit. Anyways, but I've whole. listened to it three times today already. It's just so fun. It's an album that is, that makes you want to, like get up and play with the band is how i would describe it because it's just that engaging of a listen that's my week billy cobham is like probably the best jazz drummer of all time (laughs) did anyone just notice that morgan (laughs) don't worry about it i'm gonna pull up what i listened to this week um okay that's fine not not a particularly busy week for me um I decided to pick up my Manic Street Preachers uh, discography deep dive with the album I had next up, which was Know Your Enemy. And it's uh, it's bad. It sucks. It's, it's, <laughs> um, which is is really... An, it's, it's more annoying than anything. Because it goes... Like, their progression so far has been like a six, a seven two tens and a five and now a four. I'm like, what are you doing? You had just gotten started and you're starting to suck already. And it's, uh, it's, but yeah, just know your enemy. Just, it sounds bad. That's his biggest problem is like, it's not solely composed of terrible songs. It just doesn't sound good. It's all compressed and gross and it just sucks. Um, Terrible album cover. Yeah. Yeah. Awful. Um, but they, in, in the in the vein of things that sound uh, compressed and grossed but are good, um, I listened to Autekers Drafts seven thirty. Um, <laughs> not not a particularly compressed or gross record, but you know, segues. What can you do? Um, Fair enough. Thus far, my second least favorite Autekers record, but it's like. A strong eight 
So that doesn't mean a whole lot. It's real good. Um, I'm, I'm continuously impressed with the ways these two fellas continue to alter and progress their sound within similar uh, soundscapes, I guess. Uh, in a complete 180 from that stylistically, um, I listened to the two albums by Thrash crossover band Power Trip. Um, this is because, as you might know, the front men of that band had passed away recently. Um, oh. And I hate when this happens, but sometimes you just hear of a band because one of their members has died, and that's your introduction to them, and that was the case here, which is really a shame because uh, their first two albums are a 7 and an 8 out of 10, respectively, and I have the distinct feeling that they were only just getting started. It's just really, really strong traditional thrash metal with hardcore influences. Um, if you like Metallica's Kill 'Em All, you should listen to these two albums. You have my attention. Um, after that, I re elected to re-listen to a classic record, uh, Smashing Pumpkin's Siamese Dream, oh. which, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of astounding how, how good it is every time I listen to it. <laughs> Um, I'm not laughing at you, Morgan, don't worry. I know. He's just, uh, <laughs> just walking oh. out of Tyler's face. It's oh, like, you, you liked that effect? Like, I was like a scene not. out of the fucking Truman Show. I, I <laughs> looked up and I swear I thought I was having a fucking acid dream. <laughs> it looked like it a Tool music video. It wasn't just that. There was a fact I'd like forgotten it was there. So when August got up, it like, came back. <laughs> well, I, I, I forgot it was there too so I, I looked up and I saw my face and I oh. didn't even register what the picture was I just thought okay I, I, okay that's me <laughs> then August was on, on me <laughs> just walking out of your face <laughs> I had an existential crisis in the space of half a second <laughs> I'm okay, sorry totally Morgan continue <sighs> right. so I mean it's, it's, it's Siamese dream what do you what do you want from me? It's mm. it's just as good as you remember it is every time you listen to it. And there you know may or may or may not have listened to it for reasons that have mm. nothing to do to do with the show at all. I actually listened to it as well for coincidentally. I had it on at one point this week. Very yeah, concur heartily. I was like uh, it's like there's like a string of like the first, I think like seven or eight songs on that where it's like they don't miss for like even slightly nope not like not even a beat yeah not at you all you just go like oh, okay we're gonna listen to one classic song after another that's how this is gonna go mm -hmm. <laughs> it just sit you down and blow your brain whole excuse me phrase like a hole <laughs> Phrasing Black out your soul. Phrasing uh, is uh, important. Uh, uh, porcupine uh, tree. Sh yeah, shut up, please. Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> <laughs> the last record that I listened to this week was by uh, a pop punk band called Stand Atlantic. Um, I'm uh, quite a fan of their previous LP and the EP that came before it. And uh, which is a, a shame, makes it a shame because this album sucks. Uh, it's the one they released this year. Um, it's just like you could basically count as a rule at this point. If a promising hot punk band signs to Hopeless Records, they have maybe one more rec good record left in them. Yeah. What a, record, what a name oh, the for your tragic label. irony. Like, yeah, what you do? just like, yeah, we just signed a hopeless. Oh, <laughs> there, and it's it's real bad because they're probably the biggest pop punk label in the world. Mm -hmm. And what about like, uh, Fueled by Ramen? Raymond, 
Roman. They're pretty yeah, you, we're going to yeah. talk about a band next week that are on Fueled by Roman. Anyway. Front Bottoms? We, we are? Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. Front Bottoms, oh. right. Um, but yeah, it's just the, the overproduction and crappy popification of a mm. promising pop punk band. It's disappointing and irritatingly typical of a band mm-hmm. signed to Hopeless Records. So I do know that feel far too well. Yep. All time uh, low type yeah. beat. Okay. <laughs> uh, is that is that your five? Yeah. I mean, you know, it would be interesting if we were discussing a group today who was signed to Hopeless Records. Ooh. Well, what yeah, that would signed. be interesting. Or yeah. or not? What the fuck, are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> the race was at one point. I thought. Yeah, Wait, like what? ten years ago. They were. Yeah. They're signed. They're, they're signed to Ep- Fucking they're signed, weird. They're signed to Epitaph now, which is bad religion. My, my, my favorite. Recurring, I, I said past tense. My favorite recurring bit on this podcast is August saying something um, elliptical, and then Morgan saying, "What the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> I don't. I don't have time to unlock this man's puzzles. <laughs> yeah, the well, Batman twenty twenty one. You can unlock my ass. <laughs> So, Asha, what have you been listening to? I would love it if uh, Paul Dano just says to Robert Pattinson in, in the Batman, "You can unlock my asshole." Anyway, um, collect give him all COVID. The, <laughs> collect all the Riddler trophies, and you can unlock my asshole. <laughs> anyway, um, it's funny that we have to choose five albums because outside of the albums for this week. Um, listening to Ilmatic for Naz and Sufyan Binging for a pod material. Um, I only listened to five other records. Um, Convenient. Yeah. Well, the first one was Boris's 1985, um, which is a collection of songs that didn't make it onto New Record, which is one of their albums. Um, and it's, just, it's kind of like Dream Poppy Shoegaze stuff. Did not expect it from Boris. Um, given the fact I've only heard No in Pink. Um, also listen to Unknown Pleasures by Joy Division. It's Unknown Pleasures by Joy Division. Um, so it is. So it is. Um, I listened to Shoo Shoo, plays the music of Twin Peaks, which I loved. Emotions. Uh, what? Is that, is that your first Shoo Shoo album? Sasha? It I is my never... first Shoo Shoo okay. album. Interesting. It should probably be everyone's. Just well, I, yeah. I, yeah I, 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 it's certainly like among their more accessible records, but it also yeah. really gives you no indication of what most of their other music sounds like. It, it yeah, sets I get the that. tone. Sure, yeah, definitely. Like tonally, it does. Um, I guess the closest, most of the the track on plays the music of Twin Peaks that Shu Shu's stuff sounds the most like is the closing track. Yeah, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. God, the closer. Jesus fucking Christ. Unsettling as fuck, eh? Yeah. That's that's ah. one word for it. Ah, it's just the way that it just completely understands what works, not just about the music of Twin Peaks, but Twin Peaks itself. And we use it into such a radical interpretation of the whole mythos is um, really good. Yeah. Um, I also, like, Twin Peaks is my favourite show um, just ever. Um Season three is probably the best season of TV that I've seen in the last few years. Um, I have no idea why you would be mentioning this. <laughs> season three is the best cinema of the 20- This is my, uh, favorite, 20... my favorite TV show of all time. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 2011s. Unironically though, Fire Walk With Me is the best Twin Peaks thing. Yes. Yeah. God. I mean, Look, Kai de Cinema have a lot to answer for for saying that season three is the best movie of last year. Um, mainly because they're wrong, even if it would be a movie, but that's not my point. Anyway, um, so I have a strong affection for the show, which is why I thought this would be my best first Shushu record, because I already have a personal connection to it. Um, but that's also a big risk, because there's a big potential for letdown. Um, and like as I said in my music board review, I think I still have a stronger connection to the Bad Lamenti originals, but I am intensely pleased that this exists. Um, yeah. I, 
also listened to Hounds of Love by Kate Bush. Oh, uh, it's classic. Hounds of Love by Kate Bush. <laughs> <laughs> there, there we go. End of segment. And I also listened to uh, Fevers and Mirrors by Bright Eyes, um, which I really enjoyed until the end. The interview? The interview yeah. is so good, though. I will debate ah! the merits of the interview with anyone who wants to debate it. Uh, it was just on. so fucking smug. And but it's, so it's, smug. it's literally doing... What it's doing is, is actually self-deprecating. It's, it's taking Connor down. Oh, piece. but it's self-deprecating in a way that's yeah, so but like, self-deprecating, you know? Like, it's, he's on. still like <sighs> intensely aware that the way in which he's self-deprecating is in, like intensely important. And it's just yeah. mm, not about it. Not about so, it. Well, I mean, to, me, to, to me, what it does is it like takes this image of the tortured songwriter, this image of the person who it's like worshipped for their sadness and basically says, like, isn't it kind of so fucking stupid how we basically idolize this or like we basically say like we basically qu- quantify suffering and like the more suffering you've experienced the the more kind of the more you're idolized or the more you're kind of held up and like it, and it kind of satirizes that with this kind of ludicrous um mm. por- portrayal of this person who's supposed to be connor but actually isn't connor uh oh, yeah, and it's not and but... um yeah, and, and has this hilarious story about like uh, this tortured childhood that's contradicted and then undercut, and it's just super super funny. I think in a way that is not always appreciated. So I let me get this. Like every... Sorry, Morgan, you go. Can, can I get this straight? Sure. So is this is this like a like a, an actual interview or is it one that he wrote as like it's it's one that he wrote but like is played like it's happening kind of like it sounds right. like a radio interview it's right it's, i don't care for it either it's, uh <laughs> that's that's really stupid <laughs> well conceptually it is like you know it's not something i would conceptually generally be on board with but i like it because the whole point of it is that it's self-aware <clears throat> and that it is basically kind of like taking a mocking eye at um the kind of privilege that connor benefits from um due to the, a particular stereotype that he fills in that particular musical landscape it's basically saying like this is stupid um, but yeah, I totally do get that it's not for everyone. It is like a moment where you've, you've been listening to a folk album, a folky emo album for 40 minutes, and then the music stops for like six minutes for an interview. And I get that. that but I, kind don't, of... I don't mind that. Like, again, one of my favorite records I've listened to this year is, um, is uh, Drinking Songs, which sure. is a folky emo album and then transitions into Hell. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's very yeah. a very good counter. It, it becomes Junji Ito's Uzumaki at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. Look, let's not linger on it. I definitely understand the perspective of not caring for it, and it's not like something I'm going to say like you're wrong. I just do. No, feel yeah, absolutely fine. I, and I'm yeah, glad you it. get more out of it than I do. I'm glad that you get stuff out of it. I, I will say just as a general point, um, when Connor does do spoken word stuff on his albums, it's hit or miss for me. It doesn't always work. Yep. I don't care for the opening track on Lifted, for example, which is like an outlier because I love that album, but I just think it opens really weakly. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there are other examples. I mean, I, I will defend that opening, but let's not get into this. Yeah. Because anyway, yeah. anyway, I just want to say... I, I skipped over Hounds of Love and I love it. I just want to say it's fucking great. Um, yeah. yeah. Those like two perfect. tracks are some of the best pop songs I've ever heard in my life. I mean, Cloud Busting. Um, yeah, Cloud Busting is great. Um, yeah, so that's me for the week. Yes. Hot crazy take, Kate Bush is better than David Gilmour. Kate Bush just wrote, wrote one of the best pop songs of all time and she's barking like a dog Ed on it. Bush. Um, really? But literally the hook for Hounds of Love is oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and it works. And it's, it's, like, and it's like good. Yeah. yeah. Um, that sounds uh, like I'll... the worst thing ever. <laughs> she sings uh, you... it better than I did. Look, there's a, the closing track on her album, The Dreaming, is her um, whining like a donkey for like five minutes. Um, it's, it's, you have to hear. I don't know if this is true, but it, The Dreaming has to be one of your favorite albums, Tyler, right? Totally. It's definitely one of my favorite. Uh, yeah, favorite that's, yep, that's, that's the most Tyler shit I've ever heard in my it's life. It's close. Um, they're, they're the, the 
there's a, like a top three Kate Bush. Anyway, um, I'll move August on. I probably hate Kate Bush. He has no taste. No, I, I wow. think Kate, Kate Bush has enough variation and creativity in her career f- to for August to stay engaged. But yeah, just let me bully the man. It's the only joy I have in life. <laughs> August would definitely say that that Hounds of Love falls off in the the ninth wave section. Anyway, yeah, um, and he'd be wrong, but he would say that. Um, yeah, August yeah, is I like know. I have not said maybe, a word. I am just maybe, sitting here. Maybe like, <laughs> yeah, he'd be like running up that hill. It's good. Moving on. <laughs> uh, like we're, potentially, we're, we're, potentially we're the like best song all, ever written. Yeah. Uh, honestly, we're all here just like, and Organ says like, yeah. It, 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 this is like my version of the cat meme. I'm yeah, that's what cat. I was doing. I was doing the cat meme. Yeah. That's what I was no, doing. I think <laughs> you. You evoked that image. <laughs> Yes. No, I think oh, August, so August, would like the, August would like the dreaming. Um, all right, I'll move on to my <laughs> five records real quick. I actually have not listened to very much new that we're not talking about. Um, in fact, I only have one new album, so I'll talk. I'll mention that briefly, and then I'll just touch on some re-listens that I want to highlight. So I listened yeah. to. Um, uh, so in the previous weeks, I talked about Prefab Sprout, the British kind of, um, the, the, the genre tag they keep getting lumped with is Sophistipop, which I hate for obvious reasons. Um, but I really don't know of a, bit of, of a better genre tag. It's kind of like Baroque pop. It's very um, uh, ornate, but also like there's a driving pop core to it. And it's very pretty and the hooks just hooks for days on these songs so i listened to their second and one of their most beloved album steve mcqueen this week uh which is uh an awesome um an awesome album and i just think that it's so cool that they named their album after a filmmaker who hadn't made a movie yet and wouldn't for the next 25 years (laughs) Sorry, dumb joke. I, th- I um, knew that's where this was going. We all knew that's where this yeah. was going. Anyway, so, uh, great album. Thank you. Uh, Prefab Sprout, Steve McQueen, would recommend. I like their debut, Swoon, more, um, but Steve McQueen is still pretty good. Uh, I also want to shout out, I listened to um, Mark Hollis uh, of Talk Talk. I re-listened to his um, solo um, album the only solo album he did uh, as a part of a contract that uh, was started with um, talk talk basically this solo album which came out in 1998 is basically the last talk talk album it's a talk talk album in all but name and it's much closer to the spirit of eden laughing stock talk talk than the earlier stuff it's basically it's one of the quietest records i've heard ever it's basically just acoustic guitar sometimes piano sometimes some woodwind instrumentation uh, and Mark's incredible voice. And if you've ever heard Mark's voice, you'll know it's one of the most singular and breathtaking voices in all of music. Um, and it's a, it's a strong 10 out of 10. Mark Hollis's self-titled album, just one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. Uh, and it's just stupid that people go, oh, not stupid, but it's, it's a shame that people, you know, talk Spirit of Eden and Laughing Sock to Death, but seldom mention this album. Uh, just because it's not a talk talk album and name when basically it's like forms the last part of a trilogy with those other two albums and listening to it after uh, Mark's death last year uh, it really is quite you know beautifully sad and aching and um, wonderful and and it's like you're you know it's like a warm hug it's 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 a beautiful record Uh, I also want to shout out I re-listened to um the Twilight Sands, no one can ever know their industrial post-punk album, which as I posted on music board is basically the sound of carbon monoxide poisoning. It is an incredibly oppressive nope. album. It is almost painful to listen to. It has these garish, um, really uh, sharp and, and ugly synth tones and, dirgy heavily distorted guitars it has less of the hooks that their other albums has so it's by far their least immediate record um and and it's just incredibly lyrically dark it's just just so dark um but it's good uh we are we may slash are going to eventually talk about the five albums of the twilight said on this podcast at some point in the future um so we'll be able to discuss it then but 
yeah, this is uh, an album to approach with caution. Um, I listened, re-listened to another all-time favorite classic record. Um, a few actually. Which ones do I want to shout out? So I'll shout out um, Block Party, Silent Alarm. Uh, I just published um, my, I, I, every few months I publish my like topster list of my hundred favorite albums. And like the soon as I published it, I realized that I forgot to put Silent Alarm on there, uh, which is a huge oversight on my part. Uh, and because Silent Alarm is basically a perfect album. Um, and yeah, I, you don't need me to tell you that. It's Silent Alarm. Uh, At least yeah. two of us know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, it, it's, it's very much the Siamese dream thing where you're listening to it and you're like, okay, so we're going to get one classic song after another and that's going to be the whole album. Mm. Cool, guys. Yeah. You could have warned Love me. It. Um, yeah. And one more album I will shout out um, that I listened to multiple times is a um, very underrated album, The Pixies, Bossa Nova. Um, mm. So I'm not going to do a hot take and say that I think it's their best album. I do still think Doolittle edges it out narrowly, but I could see Bossa Nova becoming my favorite Pixies album at some point. It's just so good. It's so much fun. Um, but generally the songs are a little bit more um, filled out than some of the shorter and more ramshackle tracks on Doolittle. It's, I won't say it's closer to conventional rock music, but um, it's, it's certainly not because there's some really weird moments on this album, but it is um, uh, certainly, I think the best uh, Pixies album to listen to first, if you're not, or if you're new to the Pixies uh, and it just is just generally super underrated and really, really good. Um, and it's, yeah. it's incredible how a group of like wood nymphs came together to be a very informative band. Yeah, exactly. Right, and they made an album called Bossa Nova, which you cannot dance the Bossa Nova to at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You can try. Um, but yeah, so I had a really great week but of do, revisiting do animals, albums I Do animals understand the lyrics to do little? <sighs> if they do, I would say very little. <laughs> That was back to back the two worst jokes mentioned <laughs> on this podcast. Yeah, no, that's that impressive. Was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where my mind is. So, I, somehow, we, ah, Jesus. <laughs> somehow, you see, smack you. We're just descending hey. further and further. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't surf for trying to that. that. What, what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> hey, okay. I hereby tender my resignation from the Jansen Tea Podcast. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Before this monkey goes to heaven, let's talk about. Stop. Already. <laughs> uh... <laughs> How cool is it that the no. Richard this Kelly is put setup. Stop. This is a setup. No, it's <laughs> no. not a setup. I was just going to say it's awesome that Richard Kelly put Wave of Mutilation on the soundtrack for Southland Tales. It's a good song. That is oh. true. Oh, is it? Yep. Yes, the pro- it is. and it's oh, the best version of Wave of Mutilation, in my that's opinion. Cool. It's a fair opinion. I like every version of that song. I just think it rules. Um, yeah, it's a great song. Let us now turn to our new releases. Um, Boy, and, Russian Kelly. Yeah, I was getting to that. <laughs> I was trying to like build it up and like really set the scene. I was like, let us now turn to my new releases, and so she was like, Rustin Kelly. <laughs> oh yeah, this, so this nice. is the same man who put a uh, weight of mutilation on the Southland Tales soundtrack, as I understand it. <laughs> and, uh, and did and did the remix to Ignition. Rustin, mm. Rustin Kelly, only the hot, hot second most talented R. Uh, Kelly uh, figure yeah. in the world of, of cultural art. As has been said many a time. Also, Casey Musgraves' ex-husband. Yes. That was, that was the word. <laughs> Just edit out this episode. Just cut it. The whole thing. That's relevant, is it not? 
I, well, I mean, first of all, you you do have here. Let me let me formally introduce this salvage this fucking disaster. I, um, I know. Rusty Rusty trying to talk about an album, then someone distracts him with a joke, like a merry-go-round. What? Rustin it's Kelly. A, it's a K- Casey Musgraves reference. Ca- Rustin Kelly. All right, um, I don't mind if the joke takes a while to get because I'm all right name. with a slow burn. Rustin <laughs> 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 Kelly is an is a European uh, electro house musician known for his 2007 album Cross. Now, I personally think audio, video, disco isn't as bad as shut everyone else says. Shut up. And this shut, one, <laughs> shut up. Shape and, Just shut up. Shape and Destroy <laughs> is my favorite song on Metallica's Kill Em All. I don't fucking do this anymore. I'm going to cancel the podcast. Okay, okay, I'm done. Uh, I just, oh, no, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Justin Kelly is an alt Americana singer songwriter who has been making waves uh, a bit in not he's not super popular really I mean the the most famous thing he is known for regrettably is the fact that he was married to uh, Grammy nominated and winning, I believe, yeah. artist yeah, Casey Musgraves. Winning. Look, the yeah. reason I um, said that was like I was poking fun at the fact that um, when you have like a famous male musician who's yeah. who has a partner that is also a, a musician, they're always kind of painted with, oh, yeah. you know, uh, wife mm-hmm. of this. So I was just kind of joking. and R- yeah, Rustin Kelly of- does kind of fall into that weirdly because I mean I've also heard him addressed by people who don't know. They're just like, oh yeah, he's married to Casey Musgraves. It's like, yeah, yeah. But, but he, um, he is, of course, you don't need me to say a very talented musician in his mm-hmm. own right. Yes, he has As this is his, on this record. His, it is his third record, his first record, um, Halloween, which was really like more of a stretch, like kind of an EP type of deal. It's like half an hour long, but it contains some of his best songs. Uh, but his real like arrival was in 2018's Dying Star, a record that two members of this podcast hold very dear to them. Uh, I, I can't imagine who they would be or, or why, but you know, uh, I hear it's pretty good. Uh, and this is the awaited, at least by Morgan and I, follow-up to Dying Star. Um, and I, I hate to, to be anticlimactic, but Rustin is a guy who still really hasn't, like, he, he hasn't really made it in terms of the mainstream yet. It's like, I've heard his songs on the radio once or twice, but if you say, like, people are way f- like far more likely to hear somebody like Jason Isbell. They're going to hear somebody like Chris Stapleton. He's in that sort of loo, but not recognized yet. And now we have his new album. He's sort of known, at least for his, his previous ventures, are they're very alt Americana, but they, they're, he has sort of an electronic tinge to his sound, specifically on Dying Star, that... Uh, he, he ventures a few different places that maybe other artists in his uh, ilk don't go. He has his own sort of brand of genre, which is Dirt Emo, which is very aptly named because he does adopt a kind of emo style sort of set of, of lyrics that feel very in keeping with that, but it doesn't clash. And what now I, what I really here. want from Rustin Kelly's next record is Dirt Screamo. I mean... I yeah, mm. Maybe maybe not from Rust and Kelly, but but Dirt Screamo as a thing would be really interesting to see, and it it would. And as for the reason this is even on the podcast, I think it's Morgan and I's uh, duty to to share his music because we are such big fans, such big fans, in fact, that before the great COVID crisis of 2020, Rust and Kelly is the last artist we saw live uh, in concert. We saw him in, in Lexington. Uh, he he's a terrific uh, act. He's he's fantastic, great singer, and uh, just a cool dude. Like just seems like a really nice guy. Um, and I think it is sort of the 
the, to set the stage, I suppose I, I'd say Morgan and I should probably go last since we are the aficionados of, of Mr. Rustin and his type of music and we probably have um, a lot to say and we just sort of wanted to, to bring this to other people's attention, namely you all. Hmm. I want August to go first. Oh. <laughs> I, I mean, I will. If, if you so desire. I, so we can have we're enough time have... to drive to Nebraska and kill you before the podcast We're going to climb our way up from the bottom of the cliff. Uh, what I'm going to say is he's going to shape think, and destroy this episode uh, going into this record with the name shape and destroy being a an anagram for the word sad I was I was like what? Or, no, I didn't put that together acronym it's an acronym, acronym. Yeah. So thank you <laughs> okay. anagram what that the took me I a off? second I'm like that's there's only three letters in the word sad that doesn't math. No, yeah, there, there you go. Me <laughs> failing already. I thought you so, meant like it was an anagram for the word sad. Oh, that would be funny. Still not uh, correct. Yeah, no, not correct. Definitely not. Uh, but, no, but it is an acronym for sad. And I had... Uh, it was a uh, country album. I had low expectations. And uh, I guess on some fronts, I'm pleased to say I'm ple- I was pleasantly surprised at points. And on other points, and at other times, my expectations were about met. But even then, it went a little above. Because I thought, overall, my thesis statement for this album is that I think it's all right. Uh, but I'll I take did, it. I'll, I'll get now for the like actual review where I explain it. Uh, I mean, right off the bat, I wasn't, I wasn't huge on the first track. I thought in particular, the vocals there just weren't really my thing. But that being said, I did think the first track was the lowest point on the album. And from there, I thought it picked up. Uh, and that being said, I did, I do quite, uh, yeah, like, first track, uh, not great. I didn't really like the vocals, but throughout the album, the vocals, I feel, got better, and they bothered me less and less. And, uh, you know, that being said, the uh, track In the Blue had a nice propulsive instrumental to back it up. Uh, then for the third track, Alive, uh, you're hit with a much softer, more compelling instrument, more uh, slow, softer instrumental with a very like compelling description of this like particular moment. Uh, Changes was a kind of was a nice song with a bit more muscle to it. Uh, and I mean, oh, lyrically on this track, I find it a tad played out, but I found the way Rustin went about it to be rather, uh, I guess, refreshing, so to speak, not not completely tired. But I guess more so than anything else, what disappointed me most about this album was I found that, like, across every song, it, like, songs felt either, like, too long or too short, like they would end early or just keep going and going. Like, uh, sometimes there's, I expect another chorus or just some other kind of verse to close the strong out on a stronger note and it just goes off and I'm like uh yeah didn't care for that or there's still another minute of just nonsense I mean instrumentally I do kind of I do enjoy kind of the howling string sections across this album and uh you know if nothing else it's only about 40 minutes long so it just gets in and out a it's, I'm not crazy about it, but I am happy to say this was not a complete flat line for me. Huh. Well, I wow. suppose that's all I can ask for. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am satisfied with, with this reaction. I, I didn't expect it. I will definitely give you that much. Nice. All right. No, all right. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to be unpredictable. That's good. A true chaotic neutral. 
I think and now uh, Sersha I think will be taking August. Sersha spot. can go next. Yeah. No, I, 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 I just meant that Sersha, if anyone is likely to, uh, to, to take August's typical spot, it will be her. But I, 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 okay. I well, well, let me dissuade you of this illusion because I enjoyed this record quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I was already a Kelly Musgraves fan. Um, Kelly Musgraves. <laughs> Look, don't worry, I've been saying that in my head all week. <laughs> Casey Musgraves. So I'm going to have to make a concerted effort not to do that again. Um, Kelly, Kelly Musgraves is Casey Musgraves' uh, yeah. younger and less successful sister. Mm-hmm. In fact, in my well, in the that's, last that's screenplay... That's a true fact. In the last feed screenplay I wrote, I had a scene where the female anti-hero sat around in her motel room and listened to, and I quote, sad Casey Musgraves playlist. Um. Uh, so this whole emo thing, I I am pro it. I I vibe with it. Um, as a classic, I don't know if you can tell. I, I I'm fond of the emo. Um, I, what? What? You know, <laughs> forget dirt emo. What I want next is dirt scar. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't want that. No one wants that. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing a t-shirt. Ass scar. <laughs> I'm wearing a t-shirt of a band that could be considered like glitch emo. Um, Fair enough. But yeah, no. Um, and I think that if like your Casey Musgraves is, is your like your Paramore dirt emo, this is more like. Mm, What's a good comparison here? So the, uh, uh, another know, maybe more, it. another maybe more gritty emo band emo, um, which is not a bad or worse thing. But I felt like it feels, the, it feels like a kind of backhanded stab at Paramore. But fair enough. I love all three acts mentioned. Eat me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Give it a couple of weeks. Okay. What? Um, <laughs> I feel like yeah. vocal. <laughs> Why does like it, or everything I'm gonna see is just sounds vaguely threatening? I, I don't feel know. like. Why does it? <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the vocal delivery specifically on this, as compared to your know, to your Musgraves, reminds me a bit more of of your emo music, and there are certain structural choices lyrical choices, stylistic choices that also remind me of this, but played with a more Americana style. I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs in the case of Jake and Morgan, so I'm going to move off of this segment. Um, what? <laughs> is that just a British saying? Um, it's definitely uh, just a British thing. I've heard uh, it before, uh, but... but I, I, have no clue I think the saying. only time I've ever heard that is on I, Randy I Stimpy. feel like this episode of the James T podcast has been <laughs> happening in a language that I have just learned how to speak. Like, no, <laughs> I still feel like I'm having an acid dream. August is sitting in front of my face, and so she just said I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs. <laughs> the only time I've ever heard that is on Ren and Stimpy. Ren's all like, I'll teach your grandmother to suck eggs. <laughs> so, okay. It means really teaching someone to do something they are much more adept than you at doing. Sure. Anywho. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, I enjoy the opener <laughs> in the blue. I think it's really strong, and I like the the lyrics of it. Um, uh, don't need a. I don't need a hospital. Um, I ain't broken. That. Uh, imposters dead and gone. It's a good line. Very vibey of the whole record. Um, in general, I think if I was to have one criticism, is that I don't I don't get much variety here. I feel like a lot of the songs bleed into each other. But when it it's strong, it's really strong. I would um, highlight the tracks. Um, Alive, mid morning lament, which I thought was really soulful and lovely. The song clean, which I thought if this were like a naughty's emo pop band this would be the big crossover hit um closest thing enjoyed that a lot and also under the sun which is like a functional closer there's like a coder in hell of a year anyway and i thought it was a nice way to close out the record um because i feel like this album is so homogenous in its sound there's not a lot more i can say 
Um, but I enjoyed it, and I got a lot out of it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I have uh, very little to say, so I'll get my thoughts out of the way pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, so I listened to Dying Star, the last Rust and Kelly record. I listened to that back in January. Um, you'll never be able to imagine why I would have been uh, persuaded to, to listen to it. But it was very good. I was, uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I really enjoyed the songwriting. I really enjoyed the variation on that record. I revisited it this week and I still really enjoy it. I do think it is a little bloated. Uh, it's 50 plus minutes. Um, You're a little bloated. Sorry. It, it does. Uh, <laughs> there are a couple, uh, just a couple, two or three, a stretch of two or three songs, I think, on the second half of that record that I think uh, just halt the pace a little bit. But the highlights in that record are astounding. So I approached uh, Shape and Destroy uh, very optimistic, basically. Um, and I don't care for it as much as I care for that record, but I do like it. Uh, I'm not really straying from the pack here. Uh, I like it quite a bit. I think it starts really strongly, again, much like uh, Dying Star did, even if it doesn't quite like have the astonishing highlight like the the three track run on 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 uh, Dying Star of Paratroopers, Battle Cry, Face Plan, and Blackout. Like, there's nothing that hits like that here, uh, for me anyway. A lot but of there stretches is, songs. There there is still plenty to enjoy. I I actually like the opening track. I think it's really uh, nice. And I just generally I think um, the production here is just really crisp, really uh, beautiful to listen to. Um, perfectly pitched. Uh, sometimes it does give the record a feel of homogeneity because it's so kind of pristine and, and shiny. Um, but I mean, that's basically a trade-off for the fact that the best songs here sound amazing because of that. Uh, particularly Radio Cloud, which I think is really good stuff. Um, basically everything I could want slash ask for from a Rustin Kelly song. Uh, I really dig that. Um, Changes and Mid Morning Lament I really like as well. Uh, and uh, Under the Sun at the end of the record, I think, is really kind of brings the record back to life in a nice way and is one of the more memorable songs here, I think. Uh, but yeah, there is, a, there is, I think, some, some padding on this record, or if not padding, then just stuff that uh, doesn't quite hit. Like what I would um, prefer, because it's a perfect length for a Rustin Kelly album, it's about 10 minutes shorter than Dying Star, but there's still too many tracks on it and there are songs that are like just barely scratch the surface of two minutes that I feel don't add up too much and I would rather have uh, an album of the same length but with um, the stronger of those shorter songs uh, filled out a little bit more um, maybe with a little bit more instrumental variation Um, but you know (sighs) Yeah, I think really the only tracks that stand out like sore thumbs in terms of me not really vibing with them are uh, Closest Thing and Pressure. Um, and I don't particularly care for the closing track, but it's really, really short, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and it sounds really nice anyway, actually. I, I like the way the closing track sounds, even even if I think the song is a bit uh, weak. But yeah, uh, I, oh, and, and third track, Alive, I don't massively care for, but but it's still pretty decent. Uh, everything else though I really like um, Brave, Clean, Rubber and Jubilee especially are pretty good songs um, again I don't have a lot of interesting um, dissection to add here and I presume that, that Jake and Morgan do so that I don't need, I, felt, I felt that I wouldn't need to worry about that necessarily but I have had this on um, for the last couple of days it's cycling through and I've, I've really enjoyed it um and it's it's competent but also full of character and also i really really dig rustin's voice i just i I just there's a a particular tonal thing about his voice that just really like um it's like velvet in my ears you know it's just so nice it it, it pushes those those nice chemicals in the brain in a way that like nobody else quite can yeah like he totally has one of those country twang voices but it's there's like a little bit more there than just the stock country twang like there's a real i don't know personality to it it's subtle but it's there um and 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 also he writes really well as well which helps add to that um personality like there's a lot of great lyricism on this record that i'm sure you're going to share you're going to highlight but yeah overall uh i do think it's a little bit um bloated and in a different way to dying star where um 
it just needed some of the songs to be filled out a little bit more whereas dying star i think could have benefited from just cutting a couple of songs but still minor criticisms really enjoyed it uh and i would not be surprised if i find myself coming back to it more and more even in the future and uh, not having to review it so good stuff uh rustin mm. if you're watching you're awesome <laughs> Um, just before we get Jake and Morgan get in, uh, there's, there's, I want to share an anecdote about this record, which is like, oh, sometimes when I listen to full records um, and I have a guitar near, I'll, I'll just like play along, find the melody riff on it a bit. With the song Changes, when the guitar solo came in, lit, just note for note was matching it and hadn't heard it, which was weird. Well, there you go. You uh, you managed to tap into Rustin. No, Nostralama. <laughs> there you go. You just you just had one ready. He's called Jeremy. <laughs> He's gorgeous. You cute bitch. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Now we now we turn to. The Dirt Emos themselves <laughs> um, for their 10-page uh, essays on why <laughs> Shape and Destroy is the album of the year. Yeah, something like that. Morgan, you want to go first or do you want me to? <laughs> no, you go. Okay. Um, okay, Morgan's given like, this a 10. I, I, I perhaps uh, undersold my, my love of Dying Star here. Um, it's probably my favorite Americana album of, of all time, like top 20. Um, it's one of those albums that like, you know, I, I've mentioned before albums like Punisher that have just been there for me. Uh, when, when times were tough uh, or like iridescence, very similar thing. Uh, Mercury and blackout were like the anthems of my life when this album dropped um, I remember vividly hearing the first song um, that I heard from Rustin in Morgan's car with his parents on the way to see a movie. I heard Mockingbird, which I was just like, holy shit, this song's good. And then Morgan Great was song. just like, hey, this is this is album of the year shit. And I'm like, okay. And uh, he won Lion. And I went back and I visited uh, Halloween, which I didn't know existed until Morgan told me about it. And I really, really love that release just because it's very tight and very soulful and the production's really good. And it's just, it's like a really great all killer, no filler, like 30 minute record. And it's got songs like Black Magic and A Thousand Graves and Hollywood, which are just like, like top Kelly canon. Uh, and and I and I love that album despite it being like less substantial than than the other two, so you know, needless to say, very excited for Shape and Destroy, uh, especially after seeing him live. Um, the only single I really paid attention to, I, I listened to like a little bit of Rubber when it came out just to get a feel for it, but I was like, I want to listen to this in the context of the album. Uh, and it was odd just because at first I just sort of listened to this and I was just like, this is really not what I expected. And it, it's curious, I guess, in a way, I sort of expected him to sort of go in that more, like just maybe play around a bit more with that like electronic stuff that he did on the previous album, like songs like um, Son of a Highway Daughter, where he has like this really, really heavy electronic processing on his voice. Um, and I think those moments really, really work and give that like song and that album, a lot of personality. And that doesn't show up here. And I was a little disappointed uh, because of that. And overall, I would deem like the sound and sonic direction. I think the production's pretty like perfect, honestly. Like, yeah, it's shiny, but it's very like, Rustin's always had like a really like, I, I won't say he's got like a pop appeal, but he's just, he's got really good, strong, hooky songwriting that just sort of lends itself to that sort of pristine production. Uh, and he really leans into that here. So once I sort of got with the groove, um, but um, I do really think this is an excellent release. I think it's, um, uh, I've listened to it endlessly, like maybe the album I've heard the most over and over again for this podcast so far, just because it is shorter, but it's also just, you know, I, I deem it to be strong with no general like weak points. Um, that said, 
if I had to say what my least favorite project from him thus far is, it's probably this. Uh, it's Marius because... and PC Musgraves. Oof. Sorry, no, move on. That was a bad joke. <laughs> Didn't think it through. Move I on. made the joke last week. I mean, that I, I have no right to criticize you here. Um, but I, I do actually slightly agree with August on one point specifically, is that some of these songs just feel a little too short for their own good. I want a bit more development in some of them. Not a lot of them, but some of them. Um... That said, like, just the fact that I think that this is more of a sidestep than a step further for, for his sound, and I think that maybe this, this album as a whole, I, I would have liked it, like, honestly, I don't, like, I think Dying Star, while being an, an album that is 10 minutes longer, I think it earns its length just because I love every song on there so much. Um, and I kind of would have liked this record to be a little bit longer, too, maybe not more songs, just more fleshed out songs like specifically there are some songs where like the chorus kicks in like before the 30 second mark and i'm just like whoa all right we're just we're, we're mm. going um but i got kind of used to that the more i listened to it and i you know you can argue stockholm syndrome all you want i don't care um but that said it leads this experience to being very uh the killer to filler ratio being quite high in its favor um much like halloween um, it doesn't have like the weirder kind of experimental or like uh, spoken word ventures that that, that that album has that kind of like elevate it for me a little bit, I guess. Uh, but what I find really interesting about Shape and Destroy, uh, as August pointed out, the title of this is kind of significant, not because of it being, you know, sad, but the actual title, Shape and Destroy. If you listen to Dying Star, Dying Star is an album about being at your worst. It is an album about... Like, not just feeling bad, but you are in a shitty place in your life. You are, you have problems with addiction, you have codependency issues, you, you have drug problems, just, just the absolute worst a human being can be at, and you just feel lost. And that is Rustin going through and, and working through this, uh, putting his grievances with himself to task on that record. Uh, in, in a very... Um, dark, very introspective and revealing and kind of haunting way. You've got songs that are like really catchy, like Blackout, but when you like listen to the lyrics, it's like, wow, I want to fucking die. Um, and, you know, Dying Star, that's a, you know, apt metaphor. But Shape and Destroy, I think, is interesting because it's sort of something that implies formation, destruction, and change. And that's a prevalent theme on this record is that of moving forward, but not necessarily arriving at a point. This is a transitionary period for Rustin personally from the lyrics, from the themes. He is trying to move on from where he was on Dying Star. And it sounds like he's in a genuinely better place on this record. He's got like all these problems, but he's, you know, mentioning stuff like he's learned, like he's like, oh, you know, I'll. Um, I want to spike my coffee, but I know where that goes. So he's like, he, he's putting more thought into his actions. He's got people to support him. He has a, a woman in his life he's very, very grateful for, which makes the song alive really, really, really fucking sad in uh, mm. retrospect because he's in a song entirely about how he is happy to be alive because of the love that he has in his life. And, you know, Mm. Uh, so mm. that the, the the divorce kind of actually casts a heavy shadow on on this record just because it did seem like when this was recorded he had clearly progressed further but there's also the sort of fluidity of, of not arriving there yet he is still not doing great and battling demons on and like reconciling with his past and he's like trying to hope better for the future uh one of my favorite tracks on here sort of exemplifies that, that being uh, Brave. And Brave, specifically, and Alive are two songs I really, really like because they're very low-key, they're very subtle, they're a bit more of a vibe, but um, on Brave specifically, it's just, it's heartbreaking how he's just trying to come to terms with the fact that he, like, he's, like, could likely succumb to his vices and die, and he just wants to be known as somebody who tried, which is just 
such a fucking relatable ass sentiment. It, it's it's kind of hard not to to get me a little weepy. Um, and then he's got songs like Clean, where it's just like he has clearly progressed um, from that point. And you have Under the Sun, which is sort of like the climax, as, as mentioned before, of this like just euphoric, beautiful rise of just it's so anthemic. And you really get the impression that like he is like he's on the verge of, of being able to get there. And it's like as somebody who's been following his career and who saw him live, I, I feel kind of proud of them for making it this far. I have a connection with them. And there's sort of a, that's just sort of the general attitude on this album of, you know, I've come far, but I've got a long way to go. And that influences his songwriting a lot. And I think it's going to be interesting to see the direction he takes from this point forward in his sound, because I don't know if maybe he's going to hearken back to stuff like on Dying Star, if he's going to sort of stay the course uh, with a more traditional alt Americana sound, but also thematically, I wonder if he's going to take a darker turn and sort of revisit something like he did on Dying Star, or if he's going to be able to move past something like clearly devastating uh, to his character and and try to to build upon it in a more like less cyclical way. And while it it is somewhat disheartening to know that something really bad happened to him after he clearly uh made some made some progress um it's a great album to listen to to just feel like there is there's there's hope to find like just some like kernel of of gold in a, a mountain of bullshit which is is inspiring and i feel like that sort of the length of Dying Star sort of gets that point across and that you are sort of mired for a very long time in the misery that he is trying to get across. Whereas here, the songs are quicker, they're faster, they're punchier, they are, uh, they, 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 they're brighter in, in many respects. Even the sad songs don't feel as, as dark, they feel like tragically hopeful. And I, I really like that vibe. And so while I don't necessarily think this is a forward step in every way for Rustin, I like the thematic uh, direction that he has taken. And I was overall very, very satisfied. Um, I, I'd say that if there's any weak point in the track list uh, for me, uh, I'd say Jubilee doesn't really do much for me. And it also suffers from being in between uh, Rubber and Closest Thing, which I are songs that I really, really like and I think are essential to understanding the core of the record. And Jubilee, fine song, um, but the lyrics just aren't up to snuff of the standard that I would put Rustin's other stuff with. Uh, not quite as catchy as the more anthemic stuff on here, like Radio Cloud. Um, but there are just so many of, like, there's a lot of stuff I would consider to be among his best work on here. And so if you're a fan, an absolute must listen. And as August and uh, Sarah should have proven even if you are not totally in love with Rustin or not familiar with him at all, this is not a bad point of introduction at all, considering Dying Star could be too much or too sad or too long or some of the production choices might not be to your liking. So this is also a great point to start. Uh, maybe my least favorite of Rustin's three records, but only by like a hair. But yeah, I really, I, I, I quite love it. It's very good. Very good. Well, 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 well. Uh, yes. Crack so, out the alcohol for this one. It, uh, not that that would be be against the coda of the album, dear boy. Uh, um, oh, true. Okay, I'll wait. <laughs> wait until I'll nine. save it for yeah, you, You'll need it for for when, for when, King's when, STD or whatever that album's called. When no one gives a shit. Um, yeah. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah. So, Dying Star in my is in my top twenty favorite records ever. Um, I'm not going to go into my history with that album, um, but it's pretty much the same journey that I had with uh, Gang of Youths. Go farther in lightness, which you can, if you're unfamiliar with my journey of that, we have a whole ass review of it. Yeah, in which I detail review. that. So good review. So should, Go watch that. So check that out. Um, both those albums came along for me at the exact same point in my life. So uh, 
at this point, when someone makes an album like that, I have, I pretty much give them carte blanche in sense that I will check out whatever they put out before and after um, pretty much no matter what, unless, you know, what happened with brand new happens, you know, make an exception there. Um, yikes. Yeah. So yeah, very excited for this release, as you might imagine. Um, I know it's coming off of the heels of Rustin getting sober and getting to a stable place in his life. And uh, yeah, I do. I do think it's real good. Um, starts off great with "In the Blue," which is I, I just love that song, and it's immediately apparent to me at least that you know dying star wasn't really like a dirt emo album whatever that may mean um you know it's definitely like strongly like a alt country americana album no i totally and, agree yeah mm. and he, the the dirt emo thing started as a joke initially until it sort of evolved into his brand where he and then he subsequently has a cover ZP where he covers like saves the day and blink 182 that's a great EP you should listen to teenage it. dirt bag and Taylor Swift yeah. all too well are covered on that and they're both amazing yeah um but yeah it's it's clear with in the blue at least that he's now definitely leaning hard into that sort of emo ish alt rock uh persuasion of americana more so than on dying star or halloween and that is why i would argue that this is in fact a progression of his sound even if it is you know sort of simpler than uh dying star uh, it's it's definitely i mean maybe progression is not the right word but it is definitely a different enough shade of the guy's sensibilities and songwriting that you know, it's not just, it doesn't come to the sophomore slump of like, this is the first record, but not as good. Um, I definitely think it's varied enough from that record for it to stand on its own. And uh, but yeah, Radio Cloud, the following song, takes that even farther. And it's, it's I, yeah. Pretty much, that's my favorite song of the year. It has been since it came out as a single, and it still is. Um, lyrically, my favorite song on the album and of the year. I just think that song is filled with all sorts of small passages and sentiments that all come together to just deliver something that I cannot get enough of, especially tied with the sort of... The sort of anthemic production and just really big sounding take on alt country and Americana. Um, after this point, I do find that the songs do become sort of uh, more simple, I guess you would say. So I definitely see where you're coming from when you say it isn't exactly a progression because in some ways I do agree. Um, songs like uh brave and you know uh mid morning lament you know lyrical progression aside just because he's at a different place in his life than he was when he recorded dying star those songs would fit comfortably on dying star so it does feel a little bit like you know he's not really changed up much of anything but also like you know it's it's a country album. It's an Americana album. I'm not a, expecting anybody to whip out the theremin or anything. And <laughs> probably wouldn't work out too well if he did. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's it's such a clear sort of almost time capsule of the point in his life where this record was written and recorded. That is, it's like the bad stuff is behind me now, like the really bad stuff, but it's 
as the song pressure elaborates on, there's always a sort of push to fall back into those, those habits and behaviors. And that kind of thing never really goes away. Like it's like the, one of the things that happens in Alcoholics Anonymous is that the people in it will refer to themselves as alcoholics for years after they stop drinking just because it's a struggle that they always have to, you know, sort of keep in line and respond to. And I think that's what this record is so beautifully depicting is just the constant struggle between wanting to better yourself and knowing how easy it would be to go back and regress sort of. Yeah. It's a really good album. Um, in terms of negatives, I do sort of think that uh, I do sort of fall in line with the agreeing sentiment that, you know, it's sort of some of the songs here aren't exactly as developed as they should be. I think closest thing in particular comes to mind for that because it's like half of a great song and then it just kind of ends. So I don't know. It's real good, but I, it, it, it's, I'm not disappointed because in some ways I kind of expected this. So I just metered my expectations thusly you know nothing was going to be on par for dying star for me because you know nothing else could really but precisely you know it's good i like it a lot gonna listen to it a lot throughout the rest of the year fantastic yeah all right so awesome. shit, well, shall we jump into where our favorite tracks and ratings then i suppose okay uh jake you go first mm-hmm. Uh, All right. My three favorite tracks. It is difficult. There are a lot of good songs here. I'm going to go with Radio Cloud, Alive, and uh, Rubber. Um, And least favorite, I'll have to go Jubilee. Fine song, just not up to the standard of his other stuff. Uh, And I give it a a glowing recommendation and an 8.5 out of 10. Fantastic. Good shit, lad. All right, I suppose that's me. Uh, three favorites would be the kind of block of uh, Radio Cloud, Alive, and Changes. My least favorite is probably In the Blue, as I mentioned, and uh, I guess, you know what, I'll give it a six. We got one. We got one. I can accept it. Nice. Um, my three favorite tracks are. Ooh, not a burp. <laughs> I don't remember that song. I don't, I don't remember that one. <laughs> you can't do shit on this podcast, and they just race in and with the snarky comments. <laughs> you are out of line for a second. You are dead. <laughs> my three favorite tracks are the uh, aforementioned "Radio Cloud," uh, "Clean." and changes and my least favorite is closest thing and i am also feeling an eight and a half good shit incoming good shit. incoming fellini joke yeah we did the fellini joke on the sufiani episode which will be up soon um oh what what a way to plug what just yeah. we're on it i should um, have said something at the start of the video so we are content turn. machines yeah, well, I enjoyed the tracks Alive, Middle Morning Lament, and it. You know, I'm going to say closest thing. I'm going to do it. Um, do it. And my least favorite, Jubilee. And I'm giving this a seven and a half out of ten. Right. Awesome source. Uh, my favorite tracks are. Radio Cloud, uh, Mid Morning Lament, and Under the Sun. Uh, My least favorite track is Closest Thing, which is the closest thing to a bad song (laughs) on this album, but it's not bad. You're fucking relentless today. It's not bad, it's just mid. Um, But still, like I said, 
the songs I like here I do really like. I'm going to give the album six out of ten. Nice. Wow. Okay, cool. Okay, now is the time for us to discuss our second uh, new release of the week uh, from the storied and seminal artist of the rap scene, Nas. Um, Nostradamus? Yeah, the Illmatic guy. Um, <laughs> needs no or introduction. In, or, in, or in Jake's case, the it was written guy. <laughs> <laughs> True. We, 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 Tea's we, been we, spilled already. We're saying it was written is better than is better than Illmatic is like saying the Benz is better than OK Computer. That's a fucking great. lie, and you know it. They're both great, but there's, you know, one nope. is just more of a masterpiece than the other. This assumes that he has an, an, an in rainbows somewhere. It, it does nothing of the sort, Sosha. It's just it's, a th- this album is not his in rainbows, and that he, is a fact. No such thing exists this, as this far as I know. This album is his the second law. <laughs> say it's his right, drones but let's but yeah let's let's dial that back a bit i uh, just yeah just <laughs> not that bad um, use yeah. jokes i i i guess yeah. that's just mm-hmm. our way of segueing into maybe, fact no no no, no, we, no this is more like his the resistance i think yeah. you, you know no that's i'll yeah. i'll i will Still give makes you that no much. sense I, but it sounds a bit no <laughs> but if we had to find well that's the thing that's the funny thing with nas is that it's just like he's so notable for producing like and you know yeah he is the illmatic guy but you know records like it was written are very highly regarded in you know hip-hop circles and old hip-hop heads you know nas is frequently referred to as a a almost essential pick for your top five of all time for GOAT status, merely by Illmatic's um, lofty uh, reputation as a whole. And which which then, should tell you how good that album is. Well, it's, 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 yeah, yeah. And it's not even, I mean, obviously everyone comes back to Illmatic, but it's not even just Illmatic. Like, Nas has got many good records. Uh, it was written, yeah. of course, among them. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Others as well, which equally Tyler, the most titled. likely to know them, still doesn't. Yeah, and he has other great albums, which equally are titled. Um, Illmatic, uh, Stillmatic, Dillmatic, Chillmatic. I, 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 I really loved. I'm seriously. I stunned. loved finding yeah. out that one of his albums' names was actually Stillmatic. <laughs> like that. Well, like you can't make that shit up. It's it's well, getting well. Fantastic. Well, evidently someone did because they named an album it. Well, no, the thing is, like, well, Nas should What we're getting be... at here is that if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't heard Illmatic, you should go and do that. Why? You should. And, it's, and it's you good. should listen to the lyrics when you do so. Yeah, like, and like <laughs> still, still, still Medic is pretty good, too. It's still an inside Maddox, joke. Yeah, still, still Medic is not bad at all. That's the, that's the record, I believe that's the record that has Ether on it, which is another yeah. very important moment for Nas's career. Um, and then, of course, there are other great albums in Nas's career as well. The Lost Tapes is really great, which he yep. released a sequel to last year, which I actually didn't listen to, but I've heard I was, uh, was not uh, quite up to par. Uh, and I mean, even like this decade, he has still released good music. Uh, Life is Good was a pretty good album. 2018's Nasir brought Nas a bit more attention because it was part of, of Kanye's um, string of, uh, of releases um, during uh, the summer months. Yeah, it is a uh, it is an album that is twenty five minutes long, where Nas is on maybe fifteen minutes of it. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, I don't know. It's also I would say, handily the weakest album in that run. Yeah, I don't know that I would say it is the weakest of the Kanye run. There, I don't know that I would say it's if it's necessarily Nas's worst album, which is very um, no, damning with faint praise because uh, it is pretty bad. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. So we were all aching just losing sleep over how nas would would follow it up properly like the lost tapes too notwithstanding because no one gave a shit about that when it came out but here we are king's disease 2020 nas has teamed up with famed producer hit boy uh and i will say uh i think that was a smart decision i guess i'm <laughs> launching into my review first for this um 
I think that Hit Boy's beats are uh, pretty damn good across this record, actually, and the production just generally is um, pretty spot on. Uh, uh, it's exactly how a Nas record uh, should sound in 2020. Uh, it doesn't sound like, um, you know, you're digging through the mines to, or trying to, like, co- throw back to an earlier sound like Nas has been wont to do throughout his career. It sounds like a 2020 rap album. It's not, like, going to win any awards for, like, most out, out there or experimental or offbeat or wacky production, but it sounds good for what it is. Uh, and you and and that's maybe that is damning with faint praise, but I do genuinely enjoy a lot of the beats on this record, a lot of the samples that Hit Boy uses, and the way that he mixes them, and also the way that he uh, just generally mixes um, the vocalists and, and Nas himself throughout this record. I will say though, that's basically where uh, anything remotely a- approaching a strong endorsement uh, ends because much of the actual content of what is laid atop of these beats uh, leaves much to be desired. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all right. Nas, it's, the thing is as well, like to really review a Nas project uh, in 2020, or really just generally, you have to be able to separate Nas's undeniable technical skill which admittedly was was missing in large part on this year as well. But like generally speaking, he brings that technical skill to the table on most of what he does. And it's here as well. But you have to be able to separate that from what Nas is actually writing, uh, which is just inane, um, eye-rolling, uh, really cringy. Did, did, you know, did, you know did you know that Nas has a yacht? Did you, did you know that he has one? Did you know that he has a yacht, Tyler? Because I don't think that he maybe he maybe didn't mention that he has a yacht. He's got what, a yacht. It, what if we're really talking yeah. about like, inane moments on this record, there are two ones that, that <laughs> need to be addressed. Only two? Oh, look, look, I'll let you get to that, all right? You can have okay. the field to go like, nuts. I can't wait more like, to hear more it. Like a yacht Stradamus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, that's yours for the episode. Yeah, that's I. Uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so Nas as a personality uh, has lost a lot of what makes him engaging, or what made him engaging in this initially. Uh, it's kind of come in fits and spurts in the sort of later stages. One might say death throes of his career, um, but it's certainly all but absent here. Yeah, this is a really insufferable album um, to listen to. Uh, it's really, oh, really yeah. dry and, and dull. And um, the wordplay is really cheap and kind of just flat. And, and, and like Nas is, as a, the way that Nas raps is, is I think, like compelling. Like he, he, the way that he has really good flows. Um, but just, again, it's the content, everything about the content that kind of sucks. And that's a real shame. Um, yep. Uh, I yeah. So what have I written down here? I want to see like again. Some of these songs have great beats. Car eighty five particularly. I really like the, yeah. the the smooth beat and sample on this song, and I think that now sounds pretty good on it too. I think the the standout on the album is Ultra Black, which is just really catchy and cool yep. and and um, engaging and meaningful in terms of what it's actually about. And the way that, that Nas is, is celebrating black culture in a way that feels authentically, um, you know, not just riding a wave like it, certain um, cultural things feel on other parts of this record. Speaking of riding a wave, uh, we have to talk about uh, really the, <laughs> the most memorable song for all the wrong reasons on this Round album. of applause for women, everybody. Give it up for women. Kill the war is <laughs> Give it up for the ladies. This is literally the all women are queens. Uh, <laughs> if she fine. breathes, she's a butt. <laughs> as a rat. I want to particularly uh, <laughs> shout out as well. There's a moment on this song that literally made me, I couldn't stop laughing. I was inconsolable. And it's on Lil Durk's feature on this song, the hook where he goes, <laughs> please let me get this out. 
Richie independent. <laughs> <laughs> Like the, the real conviction, the real conviction in the way he sings that. Like he's like really like you know a champion of of, of the ladies. Oh, she don't need no man. <laughs> it's Wait, like what did what did Nas do to have to make this song? Like he must have done something, and he's trying to like. Yeah, yeah that's that. exactly it. So, so, so I mean, the song's song is kind of about that, though. Like, there are yeah. multiple moments in that no, song where it's like... Tyler has, is, is going to illuminate um, as to yeah, something yeah. here that's very yeah, important. Sure. Um, it's like, I want to give Nas credit for acknowledging his weaknesses, like, in terms of the way that he's treated women in the past and in terms of the way he refers to women hypocritically elsewhere on this album. Yes. Um, mm. But, but at the same time, I can't really give him credit because the way that he goes about doing it in this song is so self-indulgent, like lifting himself up, like, look at how awesome I am. Like, there's one line where he's like, uh, we, we need each other with bad tempers. We defeat each other. Single mothers, my heart's bleeding for you. These coward men that were beating on you. Let's silence them with a silencer. And like in the middle of this line, there's this ad lib he throws in where it's like, never me. <laughs> Yeah! Oh my god, that fucking killed me. (laughs) To me, to me, it feels less like the all women are queens vine, and it feels it feels more like that (laughs) that Snapchat meme where it's this 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 fucking himbo and he's on Snapchat and it's just like, damn, just found out about misogyny. That shit sucks. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) absolutely. That's it. And you know what? To give Nas credit. His his posturing is nowhere near as ineffective and offensive as Lil Durk's is on this song. Yeah. Uh, Which, and then basically I mean, the song ends with like, oh, women need to stop complaining. Men need to stop complaining. We all need to, you know, uh, get together and fight this war. And it's like, you're missing the point entirely, he, dude. He, he puts women into pedestal. And then at the very end, he's like, oh. <laughs> and then at the end, he's just like, both sides, yeah, though. Yeah. He and you're just both like, sides. what? At the end of the song. He, he, it's, it's like burning both candles. It's like burning a candle at both ends, but the candles made dynamite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get um, so that's that song. Uh, you get yeah, uh, a pretty cool. We didn't two- mention. Sorry. sorry, we didn't mention the worst part of that song is oh, that it has please. the nerve to sample Nicholas Bertel's "If Bill Street Could Talk" score. Oh yeah, yeah. I oh, that's right. I it, it, it does. Like, I can, that's a I yikes cannot, from me. I cannot fellas. describe an arc that goes like. If like here is excitement and here is devastation, I cannot imagine an arc that goes from. The start of that song and like oh 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 (laughs) (laughs) just like the second people on that song open their mouths it may well be the most fundamentally like oh no 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 it's the second most misguided piece of music of 2020 and the most misguided piece of music of 2020 is biffy clyro's cover i was hoping you said of of wet ass pussy uh, what is title, title with as you, you you I, put you said that almost identically to Ben Shapiro, like, like <laughs> yes, well, actually, um, actually ass most um p word. <laughs> if if, if I have a if, word, if if I have a pussy and you hypothetically have a pussy, I'm gonna need you to stop. Let's say, <laughs> no. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, I still have other things. No, no, I think we should stay with Ben Shapiro. <laughs> yeah. Ben uh, Shapiro, no. stay with Absolutely me. not. Ultra Our black implies the, is- the existence <laughs> of ultra white. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get Tom McDonald on the remix. <laughs> Yeah. Ultra white boy. Sorry. Uh, white boy. <laughs> Ultra white beam. <laughs> this is a is disaster. A bad dream. <laughs> um, this is a disaster. <laughs> all right. Um, hmm. So, one other aspect of this album uh, to talk about is the fact that it is stacked with features, and they are very yeah. hit or miss. Uh, leaning yeah. pretty strongly on the miss. Uh, for uh, I, I look. You all might not, might not know this, and I'm hoping that, that it will become apparent 
with time. But I love to rag on Big Sean. Uh, I, I... Oh, good. I'm so glad you immediately went to Big Sean's feature because I was just like, boy, I can't wait. Look, um, it's so funny that Big Sean is, is featuring on a song called Replace Me because it's like, <laughs> it's like yes, I wish that Nas would. Um, it writes itself. I wish the entertainment industry would. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I actually wish they wouldn't because I would rather not have another Big Sean. No, just but, delete him. Can we just replace him with like Little Sean so he's at least smaller? <sighs> I guess, I guess, Look, I this guess, is I a Big Sean verse in oh, which he voice name voice. drops Picasso and Sun Tzu, and and it's literally like somehow not the worst verse on the album. Um, no. it's, it's still pretty bad though. Um, <laughs> like his rhyming. Wobbly, on the, wobbly, wobbly, whenever wobbly, he raps, like, he has the dumbest rhymes in the world. Um, I'm stack stacking my paper. My wallet look like a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> uh, this is the Jesus. song in which Nas kicks off his verse with the line, you can't replace me like a battery. Like... <laughs> can replace Bro. batteries that's the whole thing with batteries is you can replace them. Uh, also your your place in the cultural landscape has been replaced yeah we've been new you're a name um that's it uh but yeah on the other side of the coin there are some features that are i mean yeah there are some features that are good i i think that anderson peck's feature uh, <clears> i was gonna say song. his was decent it doesn't add a lot Which of is not a testament to the quality of this album because Anderson Pack always kills features. That's just it's, a fact. It's, it's nice to hear Anderson Pack's voice. Jake. Is yep. Anderson Pack. Yep. Because he just has That's a me. nice voice. Um, so that means, you know, this album's not all bad. Anyway. Um, Tyler. Uh, I mean, uh, we've, of, we've got AZ that is, here. That is the definition of a bad joke. There are also one one other notable aspect of this album. We've got the track called Circle. I lose a year <laughs> off my lifespan with every single one of these. You've got the track. I didn't have all that much left. You've got the track Full Circle, uh, which uh, sees um, the reunion of of Nas's side project, the uh, the Firm. Uh, each of the members of that group uh, get uh, vocal uh, rapping contributions uh, on this. Not one of my favorite Tom Cruise performances. Very true, but it's nice oh, to Gary see. Um, it's nice to see because well, we haven't that. we haven't heard much from the firm for many years. I don't think. Um, so it's nice to see that kind of the arc of of that um, project's history sort of come full circle here on this track. Um, My God, fight God! And the and you know what is the funniest aspect of the track is that um, Nas's verse is the okay, weakest on it. Um, Mm. He's pretty much mm. uh, showed up by every other member of this posse. Um, that are it's relevant. an Eminem D12 situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it very much is. Uh, it's nice when Foxy Brown comes in because uh, she just has a nice tone and it's nice to listen to her rap. Um, um, and I also think that AZ's verse is, is really um, decent. Uh, although, like again, the song is a bit, um, you know, it still leaves a lot oh. to be desired, um, but it's just nice to hear competent rapping, even if the content, again, is, is you know, not that good. <sighs> yeah, I just, at the end of the day, like, I keep wanting to say, you know, this album's all right. This album's not that bad. But then it just keep, I, my, my head just keeps coming back to, oh, she defended. <laughs> <laughs> I want to die. And it's, yeah. It's an album yeah. that exists, and if this is the king's disease, I think he should really get it checked out. Hilarious. Well, I mean, uh, at the fine. end of the album, there's the cure, which I think implies something, which I don't I think wish. the cure's going to count for much, Nas, I, when I you're wish. an anti-vaxxer. Like, this album this was a cure album. Yeah, I was going to say, I wish this album would get two points immediately if the cure did show up at the end of this album. <laughs> that would be... <laughs> I mean, that would be interesting, so it yeah. couldn't happen. It would it, it would be a choice that would be remotely interesting, which is basically the biggest problem with this album is that it is it, it, it is a thirty eight minute long album that feels like it's eighty three minutes. 
and it, it just mm. it just continue like I think the biggest problem I have with this album is Nas's attitude. It's just that like I I don't want to come off as disrespectful because it's like yeah you made Illmatic man that's you you have reached a a, a peak of artistic high that I and pretty much everyone else walking the face of planet earth will never reach that said i feel like the fact that you have have coasted in you know more than half of your career does not entitle you to have a near 40 minute long album that basically serves as one giant humble brag that's not incredibly humble at all it's just he just, I mean, this, I, I, I'm going to, to pull a Sersha complaint here, but it's just, I am so, so bored of listening to rich rappers talk oh, that's about one of my how notes, fucking fuck. rich they are, because there's, there's nothing to it. He's not analyzing it. He's just mm -hmm. boasting, and it's not like a fun kind of boast. This isn't a run the jewels situation where Killer Mike and Jamie are like, there, there's a self awareness, or they're they're like getting at a greater point. But here, it's just him talking about yachts and mansions and bitches, and it's like, dude, I know that you've already like you, you've you've reached your peak. I get it. You have earned the right to coast. That said, you have not earned the right to be this fucking boring. The thing coast, about... Not to boast. <clears throat> sure. Hilarious. And the, 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 um, the other Achilles heel, other than his insufferable attitude and just constant things like he's on Till the War is One, where he's just like, you know, all women are queens. But then there's also the fact that, like, just flow wise he's just he's packing nothing i mean i don't expect people to have the, like i don't expect him to sound as hungry as he does on illmatic or it was written but i i want him to bring something to the table but his flows here are rudimentary they are standard his rhyme schemes are basic his his wordplay is lacking there there is just nothing remarkable here and like, oh, hey, and then the, I'm like, oh, it's not Nas, and then the feature actually ends up being kind of bad, and it's like, oh, okay. And as Tyler already said, Hip Boy's production is pretty much the only thing that, like, keeps this steadily afloat. Not that it's, like, great or anything, but it is, as Tyler said, it is a modern-sounding record, and, and Nas does sound a little bit out of place, but that said, it doesn't sound, like, bad, it's I mean, just the, the, I think there the are albums... points at which it does sound great, and then maybe not consistently across the record. Sometimes it's just fine, but, but the, I think it's the production wise, it's the album starts really strongly. I think with the first few tracks. No, it, it does. I I would shout out uh, Car eighty five as being a highlight, and I think the best song on here, um, which is uh, Ultra Black, is uh is really good. I like the sentiment of that song. I like how you know, it's, you know, very pro-blackness. It's very explicit about that. And it feels, again, genuine. It doesn't feel like he's, you know, just trying to, to shout one out to the community to score some points with people so he can, he can, you know, it's, it, it's mm -hmm. everywhere else. It just feels so remarkably insufferable. It's, mm -hmm. it's, if you are not invested in Nas's career trajectory, or even if you are fucking somehow, I do not get what this album is supposed to add to that. Mm. I don't think that this is a bad record in any way, shape, or form. The it, it is it is functional. It is yeah. it, it it is it serves its purpose and pretty much nothing more. And I mean, like I've said before, that the the worst kind of albums are the ones that are painfully average. So you know, you might think like, oh, why don't you hate this more? And it's like, well. I mean, I guess th there are enough good things here, at least on like the, the sonic standpoint for me to not think this is insufferable and it's not that long, but it would be a lie if I said this was anything other than a test of my patience, mm -hmm. uh, especially considering I listened to the fucking spiritualized album this morning, which ends with a 16 minute long song that feels like it passes quicker than the duration of this entire album.
So, you know, it is shorter than this entire album. <laughs> I mean, well, I get what you're saying. Oh Jake. God, I, you, you know, you know what I fucking mean, man. I'm sorry, <laughs> like the tequila's half gone. Give me a fucking break, man. Okay, okay. Also, um, I, do think so half... album, I do think, to its credit, the album does like feel fairly short, but it's just that there's just not enough. Yeah. On first Meets listen, on it feels short. <laughs> on second listen, it does not. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree sure. with that. Um, can I can I leap in sort of please bring, more hey, bring because, some life? I I. I'm having I'm having trouble passing, and you're passing my thoughts. I have trouble passing anyway, but <laughs> trans oh. anyway. Honey, uh, I want to hug you. Any- <laughs> anyway, um, so you guys, giving your thoughts has actually kind of helped me articulate mine, which has been really nice. Um, I'm going to start by saying I think it's funny that when he, in the song The Definition, attempts to define what the king's disease is he basically defines it as acid reflux um, <laughs> and if you look up what the king's disease actually is it's gout um yeah he, ta- he talks about getting gout in his i i, I, I thought it was syphilis track. well no because gout comes Jesus from eating Christ. really rich foods that only royalty would have had access to um isn't there a disease that like um the whole royal family in Britain have like it's called being German. Um <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> hey. And anyway, we just lost uh, all our German viewers. I'm so sorry. I've been to Germany. Mm. I love it. Um Filthy many, imperialist. Many times. Uh, I went to Germany Alexa, to colonize it for the Queen. Alexa play <laughs> Habsburg lip by everything everything. Ooh, kiss me, baby, with your Habsburg lip. So you sounded I, like you were doing Drake's Jamaican voice then. <laughs> anyway, I will say, you know what, Drake's you know what, version Tyler, of shouting do... out one for the ladies on um, "Nice for What" better than this song. Look, like the thing is, you could say like anything you about do a Jonathan Higgs impression, Tyler. <laughs> well, this is the thing. I'm not. I'm not. Um... You know, I'm walking the walk here because I'm not doing a Jonathan Higgs impression because I can't. <laughs> and my point is, is yeah, that anyway, it's difficult to do. That's thin. Your point is to anyway. demean me. Anyway, um, where was I? Yeah, I find it funny that we're bringing up a rapper like uh, Nas and we're talking about Drake's awful patois that is just the most annoying sound in the world. Um, but yeah. Um, where was I? There are, I think this album is like fine, but every time I listen to it, I, I, I hate it more. Um, yep. and that's a real problem for an album I start out kind of appreciating. Um, because it means every time I listen to it, I'm disappointed just a little bit more. Um, and the thing is, it's like every time I bring up something positive, I have to bring up like 11,000 caveats, or it's like, I, I, beautiful way of putting that, honestly. Thank you. Where it's like, yeah, Nasa's flow is amazing as always, but his I feel like his that just means that when there's a feature on the record, except for like two, they add very little that Nasa isn't already bringing in terms of style and flow and interestingness. Um, I feel like I, I appreciate the way in which he comments on on being. I mean, I'm I'm not a person of color, but I appreciate the way in which he articulates that experience. What? But, but, oh my God! It's like every way he comments on every other intersection of ideas, awful. Like, in the like, you get to something like Twenty Seven Summers, which has the hook twice. We need more black CEOs, which is that's that's just that's a joke at this point i thought we all agreed that was a joke um like you have the song um the war is one which um well whichever one it is um which is like i think it might be full circle god this album is forgettable where um you have stories about characters actually doing like the hard work of self-interrogation in regards to misogyny. And then you have the rest of the record and how that talks about women. Um, and and even then, when I talk about that, the, the moral of the story isn't like 
you too should do this kind of self-interrogation. It's, aren't we amazing for not thinking women are property? Um, which, so it's like, I really struggle to talk about this record because there are good things that are simultaneously awful um, or remind me of awful things about the record. I, I concur with Jake, it's one of my notes, and I want to be a bit more specific. It's not that I'm bored of hearing rich rappers rap about being rich, so I'm really bored of rich rappers rapping about how awful it is being rich. Um, yeah, that does not help. It's just like, oh, poor me, woe is me, so many monies and Yeah, yachts. absolutely. Uh, yeah. Logic. <laughs> like, there, there's a line on this album in Blue Benders where he raps about being angry, he has to pay taxes. And oh yeah, like... I remember that. That <laughs> was really cringy. Oh. Yeah. So they give my and... homies, and I'm just like, oh, fucking shut the fuck up. Honestly. And it's just like you can't. Why? Why can't I not pay taxes to me? <laughs> and and, and I feel like be like Al Capone. <laughs> I feel like every time he raps about um, anything gender related, even vaguely positive, it is still mired in horribly toxic gender binaries, um, <laughs> like. He ridicules people who don't live up to a toxic um, masculine ideal uh, of talking in estrogen speak, which is just really obnoxious. And I, I feel like that's the ultimate thesis on the record is that it's obnoxious. Um, yep. and, it, and, it, and it's wrapping from a point of like, it, fundamentally, this is an album about legacy, really. Um, and although Nas has a legacy, um, I find it very, I find the record boring. And when you're rapping about like, how do I deal with all of my greatness on such a boring record? That's annoying. Um, and that's not to say there aren't highlights and it's not to say that I won't give this a rating above a five, which I will. But those are all worth shouting out. The production is adequate. The flow is really good. There's some moments of just like vibing to word flow, even if the words are obnoxious that are very enjoyable. And there are features like, uh, well, there are features that I appreciate, but I can't get over how every time I listen to this, the flaws just stick out more and more and more. And it, it's like you get to a song like 10 Points, which has a, a, a chorus that is simultaneously filled with sticky hooks that are simultaneously obnoxious and annoying in their substance. Um, and it just makes it a really confusing and annoying record. And it, that's another point against it really is that when you have done a competent job of making it sound nice uh, and you are then annoying me with what you would do with it, that's really, that's making it worse or it doesn't need to be worse. It's like an unforced error where you were just like annoying me because you're putting annoying things around good things, which is just like, you know, if you're there on a sunny day, we just have a migraine, you know? Um, so that's my attempt to just push through my complicated thoughts on this record. Um, I, I think you've touched on a lot of things that I feel similarly, but probably more broadly positive about, but it is just a record that I'm never going to return to. And if I do, it will get gradually worse in my head. You, you you said something that I meant to say, and that was for every good thing about this album, there is something bad that counteracts it and makes it not matter, and it just kind of cancels mm -hmm. it out. Like, mm -hmm. Nas's flow will be good, but the production will be boring. The production will be good, but Nas's lyricism is distracting. The feature will be bad. Nas's lyrics will be good. It's, it's just a complete fucking toss-up. Okay. August, I'm curious to hear your th thoughts on this album. All right. Well, uh, first off, Gotta do something. Hello. Because, uh... Oh my God, my face is gone. I never listen to Pablo Honey without creep. Oh, oh no. I never wake up without a beep. I never listen to King's Disease without going to sleep. <laughs> You put more effort into that joke yeah. than Nas did into making this album. Mm -hmm. yeah. It worked out so, about uh, the same, though. <laughs> I got way more endearment and enjoyment out of August's joke. I don't know what you're talking about. Taste their own. So, uh, this record, uh, this, this is about the uh, 
musical equivalent of like a uh, like a sauna, I guess. You just kind of go there. It's kind. It's mildly pleasant, but by the time you're out of there, it's it's, it's, it's like a in, sauna. You just kind of go there. You just kind of go there. <laughs> it's not something I would put on to relax, though. Well, no. it's like a depressive episode. I just kind of go there. I mean, uh, I mean, I I do find I I will counter that point by saying I do find this album at least to an effect like kind of laid back, kind of relaxing. And I feel that to me is more on the performative side of things because while I do think Hit Boy's production is for the most part pretty good, he's got some, lays down some good beats here. Uh, Nas, Nas's raps, Nas's delivery is just so, He's just at the point in his career where he doesn't have to care anymore and he can just fart out a record like this and be like, yep, it's going to sell a bit and I don't care. It's, it's done. I'm done with it. Who cares? Like, uh, I think that's evident by the fact that this is like filled out with features so he can just be as on it as few times as possible and like ultra belt. Like, there's never a moment on here where I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a poignant line. That's a, that, that line really, uh, that, that like really captures something, makes me, makes me think. I mean, even the... You're tell, you telling me the ooh, she independent wasn't thought-provoking? <laughs> ooh, she independent. She don't need no man. Uh, that that, that, uh, that sounds like a line that would be in pop star, never stop, never stopping. <laughs> Totally. That's exactly. I mean, it. that's the same. You know, you're, vibe. you're you're right. It is. It is thought from both. I'm not gay, Morgan. but if I was, I would <laughs> want equal rights. <laughs> 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 there was the cough that really sold yeah. that moment. I really, I really choked a little bit there, but it, it uh, turned it into better than what it would have been. But no, it, it is, you're right, Mark, and it is a, a thought-provoking moment. It makes, it, it provokes thoughts of uh, jumping out a window, you know, good, yep. good thoughts. Uh, I mean, even the, the, like, Doja Cat line on Ultra Black, which just got hyped up by Twitter, like, oh, you said that about Doja Cat? I was like, wow, that, it, it plays off almost like, like an aside like that's not even part of the main song. He's just like saying it like, <laughs> like so like provocative a, line, Ugh. provocative line. Like it, it, it feels like something a comedian would say after they've like told a good joke and they're just like trying to fill the laughter. Like, oh uh, yeah, do hoo hoo. It it feels like that. It's like isn't what what? It it that's just how he delivers it. That's how he delivers most of his album. Like. It's come after a really good joke in a comedian set, and the good joke happens to be his like first two albums, and the laughter has just been the rest of his career. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's nice, it's fine if you just refuse to read the lyrics, which make this record a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. Just. Uh, I mean, you know, if you struggle to keep up with lyrics on Nas albums, then this is the one for you. Yeah. Well, this because... is the one for you if you want to ignore them altogether. No, really. Exactly. If you just if you just want to hear a guy kind of mumble over beats, it's a nice nice album. Uh. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, gosh. Zach made the point last episode where like uh down in the weeds is is like it's it's nice. This is this is nice in the same way where I'm like, oh okay, Nas is still making albums. Good to know. Moving on. <laughs> he's alive. Uh, he, he's he's not dead. Uh he's yeah. an anti vaxxer, that might not be true for a while. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna say, thank God yeah. he, he holds off on the anti vax bars for this album, which Oh uh, god unforgettable on this year that that would be hilarious if he did that on mm. this album. 
I can't wait for the NAS song about refusing to take the coronavirus vaccine whenever it drops. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> whenever it drops. On SoundCloud. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise release, oh, COVID-19 <laughs> vaccine. <laughs> Drake releases COVID-19 COVID- vaccine. COVID-19 <laughs> vaccine does a Beyonce. That is going to be a dystopian future we live in, though, where, like, an artist is going to, like, sponsor a vaccine. The fuck do you mean future? Yeah, it's already <laughs> happening, eh? All right. Yeah. Morgan, I think you're the only one that hasn't spoken about this album here. Do you have anything you want to add? No. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just joking. I don't want to leave you out. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. And uh, in, in all seriousness, I think pretty much... Everything that everyone said has been pretty spot on. Um, his, his record is boring as hell, and I'm tired of listening to mid ass albums. Me too, especially yeah. mid ass hip hop albums. Ugh. I was thinking that same thing. I was just like, thank God for Run the Jewels being an album that we all so heavily fucked with yeah, no. and praised on God. this channel. My, Otherwise, my we would just be. Oh, what we, God, what I wish we Run need the is Hendrick to finally release. The damn sequel. I, I mean, I would, I would take it honestly. Just anything. <laughs> just anything. It's, it's been three years, Kendrick. This rap, rock, he's, 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 this rap rock album with Rick Rubin. Well, he's he's, he's making it right now. He's filming either. music videos right now. Oh. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's he was it. spotted in L.A. like twice and on like the beach the other day, and they were like oh. with the crew. It's such a strange feeling knowing that it's imminent and yet we don't hear yeah. it. I love that we're talking about an album that we haven't heard. With it way it's it's going to be diversity. more interesting than this. <laughs> um, well, anyway. There's a Zach Demo Rocha feature on it. Sorry, a uh, who? Zach, Zach Demo Rocha. <laughs> Zach Demo <De> Rocha. <laughs> Zach Demo Rocha. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, they the soul. Um, right, let's do our <laughs> favorite tracks and ratings. <laughs> uh, I'll go first this time. Uh, my my favorite tracks on uh, King's Disease. Um, let me get yeah, trickles. right. <laughs> my favorite track on King's uh, Disease is um, uh, Car Eighty Five, Ultra Black. Uh, and The Cure, uh, and the worst track on King's Disease is Till the War is Won, <laughs> and it gets a uh, 5 out of 10 for me. Okay. Uh, oh, is that me next? I think that is me Yes. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately. So. Oh, shit. Wow. Shade hey. thrown. Yeah. I, I was referring that she has to pick favorite tracks on King's Disease. Okay, you didn't. Not you didn't, shade. You didn't elaborate that very well. Yeah, well, well, I figured you could interpret that. I mean, n- now I look no. like the asshole. What are no, your still, tracks? Naz is, Naz is still the asshole. Um, True. Okay, good. So my favorite tracks on Nas in 2020 were. Um, probably Ultra Black. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, Close Your Eyes and Count to Fuck and Legend Has It. And my least favourite track was... Um... I don't know, the one where every... The definition. I hated that so much. Uh, that was the, such a my, bad song. My, my, my three favourite tricks are uh, New York State of Mind, Life's a Damn it. And it ain't hard Damn my joke! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, Sorry. <sighs> Morgan, what are I your have, three favourite tracks it. on King's... I haven't, I, I haven't oh. rated it. But it's oh, a five this, and a half. Okay. I mean... Whoa. Woo me. It's a five and a half. Do I have to actually list my favorite songs on here? Fuck yeah. me. R85. If you insist. Ultra Black. Uh, Blue Benz. I, guess. I, don't fucking, I don't remember what any of these damn songs sound like. Every time someone says Ultra Black, I just get All Black Everything from Clippings. Um, all Black Everything. Splendor, That's a song. Stuck in love. Don't fuck with it. 
My yeah. least favorite All black is um, the 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 massacre of Nicholas Bertel. <laughs> yeah, fuck five that. out of ten. What was it out of ten? Five. Fair dues. Oh boy. Go uh, guest. So I'm gonna say uh, my my three favorite tracks would have to be uh, Ultra Black. Uh, car 85 and uh, uh, I guess uh, I don't know like full circle because everyone but Nas on that song's all right uh, least favorite would have to be uh, tell the war is one and uh, rating wise I'm giving this a Five. Oh, wow. 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 That wow. took me all two minutes wow. to make. And by two minutes, I mean wow. ten seconds. Wow. 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 I'm wow. so impressed. Uh, my favorite <laughs> tracks In are this. Ultralight Beam, Saint Anger, and Satellite, comma, Chinese. And my least favorite track is... <laughs> Uh, the the one where he says all women are queens, and my rating oh, is yeah. a four point five out of ten. <laughs> are you okay, Morgan? <laughs> He's a thought. <laughs> what? <laughs> she's a thought. I'm a thought. Is is she's a thought? What we can say about Scarlett Johansson at the end of Lucy? I don't know that's what the, the hell for you're this talking ep- that's, about. That's that's going to be it for this episode of the it's Jams and Tea Podcast. Not going to be because we've got to talk about the Angel Olsen album, Holy Miss. Oh. Um, so this is a bonus segment that oh, yeah. I will not be so, a part yeah. of. I'm Who's not going to be part of it either. It's going to be is it just me and Morgan. I I, I, I think Tyler also. Oh, Tyler. Yeah, it's going to be oh, okay. short. I don't have much to say. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Um. Uh. You. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um. Fuck it. Uh, Angel Olsen, really, really good singer-songwriter. Um, uh, she's got lots of great albums. I listened to a lot of them in preparation for this. Didn't really know what this was going to be, but it turns out it's just kind of uh, more stripped back and acoustic covers of her songs on all mirrors, uh, some of them at least. Uh, I think... It's sort of a, it, it's an interesting mirror album in that way because All Mirrors is, haha, <laughs> funny, uh, because All Mirrors is like sort of represents a, a very far progression in her sound going like a little bit more Baroque, um, a bit more like full sounding and just kind of lavish and like, I mean, it sounds more like something along the lines of like Julia Holter than it does her old stuff. Um but so it's sort of neat to see some of those tracks and other songs uh, s- really sounding more like they did on her debut Halfway Home or even My Woman in some instances. Like these are mixed so roughly. You could probably like their, their demo quality. Uh, that said, I like the roughness to them. Uh, Angel's voice is immaculate as always. Um, The songs that were good on All Mirrors are good here for very different reasons. Um, I enjoyed this release a lot, but it is not exactly a huge uh, highlight or standout in Angel's career. It's really more like a uh, a, a passing venture, a a curiosity, I think, for fans. Um, I don't really have much to say beyond that it's just like it's a good solid release the songs are good it's stripped back if this sounds appealing to you it probably will be and there you go oh. morgan what, uh, what what do you want to do what hmm? what i would have to do is yeah um all for this uh, All Mirrors was one of my favorite records of last year, and uh, Great record. I really in- enjoyed hearing these uh, basically demos for those songs. 
but they are fleshed out to the point where they kind of feel like just alternate stripped back takes mm-hmm. on the songs. And I, I really appreciated hearing them. And uh, I, I do like the two new songs on here a whole lot as well. Yeah. And uh, I, I do admit I was disappointed to hear that this was not an album chock full of new material. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's only a year after All Mirrors. Can't be that mad. Yeah. Real good. Liked it. I mean, look, I'll be quick. Uh, and I'm pleased you've said nice things because I don't particularly care for this record. Uh, in fact, I think it's comfortably the weakest uh, release that Angel has put out to date. Um, oh, no, easily. <laughs> and I, the thing is, I loved All Mirrors. I think I, it's actually my favorite Angel Olsen album, um, which is, Gang. I think, a bit of a hot take. Um, but I do really love it. Um, and I want to set, preface this by saying I like her earlier, more stripped back, bulkier stuff as well, particularly Burn Your Fire for No Witness, which I love. Um, uh, but this sounds muddy. Uh, it sounds uh, really like what it. What it does is it strips away a lot of what I loved so much about All Mirrors was the urgency of it. The way that the emotions that Angel was conveying felt so massive, felt so completely all-encompassing that she needed the gigantic string sections of that record and the enormity of of John Congleton's um, production uh, to convey that uh, and to kind of uh, complement those emotions whereas here all of that is stripped away and and of course because these are such stripped down versions for the most part angel is singing much more softly and quietly which robs uh not necessarily all the time but for the most part she's what she's doing and it robs uh the songs of a lot of what made them work and and, and the whole time i'm just like i don't why would i listen to any of these versions when when the i have the ones that are actually sound finished and actually communicate effectively both musically and lyrically what angel's trying to get across i mean here obviously we still have the lyrics and the songs that are reinterpretations and they're still good lyrics but they're not complemented by the arrangements with one exception uh and i think that is the stripped down version of album closer chance uh which i think sounds great here uh and really benefits from the sparseness uh, her vocals really soar on Chance uh, in a beautiful and expansive way, and it sounds really gorgeous, and this is the one uh, alternate version I will be going back to, because I really like it, and Chance was one of the best songs on uh, All Mirrors, um, so it's nice to see this rendition that feels faithful to the way the original feels, but does take it in a different direction in terms of being more stripped back. Uh, that said, <sighs> most of this the vocal performances are just not compelling uh on the new tracks they're not compelling uh and on even the tracks where the strongest tracks here like lark that are aside from chance like lark song and impasse uh even though stronger tracks sound like shit um the, there's there's clearly a lo-fi compression quality that has been added uh, that's very typical of, of of congleton and clearly it's like meant to emphasize the demo feel of this record because uh, these aren't just like here are the demos they have been dressed up um, and there's clearly like they're produced in a way to sound a very specific way and that way is terrible uh, in a lot of cases not all cases but in a lot of cases where it's just like buzzed out and 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 yeah you can just hear like sound bleed in some of these songs and it's just really unattractive um, production for for what they're going for here because there is like a similar kind of there's some compression on all mirrors but it works it benefits the arrangements and their hugeness um yeah so ultimately i i hate to say this but i really did not enjoy the experience for the most part of listening to whole new mess and i'm glad that we relegated it to a, a side segment because i think like having to really dissect this at length would um I think not be all that fun because it's just like, it doesn't feel like a meaningful uh, addition to what Angel accomplished with, with all mirrors. And, and aside from the alternate version of chance here, I won't be going back to this. And um, 
yeah and I'm, I'm i'm sorry to be negative but um but yeah it is um not a decision that i particularly cared for uh which is not to say that i don't want to hear angel work with more stripped down arrangements but again the the songwriting needs to complement the arrangement and also it needs to be produced in a way that feels appropriate for that arrangement which is n not the case here for the most part so yeah uh big fan angel but i just couldn't vibe with this one sorry to say well i hate you understandable <laughs> So, Jake, what are your three favorite tracks and least favorite track on this uh, Angel Olsen album? Uh, well, um, I really like Chance. Um, I really like uh, the redone version of Lark's song. And I guess if I had to pick, like, a least favorite, I'd say, well... If I had to pick the one that's like the least, that, that does like the least for me, I'd say uh, the closer on it, uh, what it is in parentheses, what it is again, uh, it's fine. Don't particularly care for it. Light seven. Yeah. I didn't write out favorites or least favorites. So seven. Okay. Um, yeah, so three, three tracks I did enjoy. Uh, we Are All Mirrors. Summer Song and Chance, of course. Uh, least favorite track here uh, is definitely Impasse, where, again, that, that production really harms it. Uh, and I'm going to give this, regrettably, uh, 4.5. It's like we're at an impasse. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right. I'm sorry. I, I would I'm just say that I, I have not listened to the album because, God, have I been busy? Um, but I really enjoyed the short review done by one Mr. Mike the Snare on his YouTube channel with the Pirates of the Caribbean clip. It's funny. Oh, you should yeah, watch yeah, yeah. It. Yes, I remember that. That was very funny. And it's exactly, it's, I feel very similarly to what that clip conveys. Right. All right. So that is this episode of yes. the Jams and Tea podcast. So next week on our main episode, uh, we are going to be reviewing... Uh, at this stage, uh, the new release from the front bottoms. <laughs> Ursha Core. Sorry, um, just the phrase, the new release from the front bottoms. <laughs> is, is very just, funny. That's just the worst thing I've ever heard. Uh, it's called In Sickness and In Flames. Uh, let's hope it's good because lately we've had a trend of, of albums on this channel where it's like the title suggests it's going to be like the title I'm, I'm not invites home. mockery. Let's just say. Well, it's, it's also I've had a trend of like me bringing on bands I really like with a new record and they're just painfully mid. Look, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see awful. how it goes. And we are also, I believe, going to be discussing a band that I've never heard of and I'm not entirely convinced exists <laughs> called The Pineapple <laughs> Thief. Um, Thank you. And their, and their no. um, uh, seminal release versions of the truth. Uh, so we, we look forward to discussing those. Uh, we are also we've also uh, releasing uh, probably will have released by the time you see this uh, as I alluded to earlier a record club video on the album Visu by Thrice, uh, which you should go and check out now. Uh, and next week's record club review uh, is going to be Sersha's pick, uh, which is, is it's going to be the uh, seminal again um, folk punk yeah. record Violent the Fans. Violent Femies. By the Violent Femmes. Those the Violent Femmes. Those are, yeah. The Violent Phoebe Bridgers. So, as always, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Pepsi. That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs>